My next guest is one of the most influential and to many controversial political scientists in the world. Most recently, he stirred controversy with his ferocious criticism of Israel's attacks on Gaza. Many of you have called for him to appear on this show with thousands of comments like this one. I wonder if Piers Morgan will be brave enough to have Norman Finkelstein on his show. Well, I'm pleased to say the answer is yes, because we believe in being uncensored here and hearing from all voices. And so I'm joined now by Professor Norman Finkelstein. Professor, thank you very much indeed uh, for joining me. I appreciate thank it. For, uh, like I said, a lot, of people wanted, a lot of people thank wanted you. me to interview. You yourself tweeted that uh, we, we hadn't done it. So here we are. I'm glad about it. Um, I think you're an influential voice. And you've obviously been very uh, vocal about this since it all uh, kicked off. I want to take you back, uh, if, if I may, to, the, to October the 7th, because your first reaction to what happened on October the 7th incensed many people. Uh, you uh, posted on Substack uh, a piece about what had happened on the day, and it included this. For the past 20 years, the people of Gaza, half of whom are children, have been immured in a concentration camp. Today, they breach the camp's walls. If we honour John Brown's armed resistance to slavery, if we honour the Jews who revolted in the Warsaw Ghetto, the moral consistency commands that we honour the heroic resistance in Gaza. I, for one, will never begrudge. On the contrary, it warms every fibre of my soul. The scenes of Gaza smiling children as their arrogant Jewish supremacist oppressors have finally been humbled. And you ended by saying, the stars above in heaven are looking kindly down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. The souls of Gaza go marching on. Uh, with the benefit of, of uh, a few weeks now, do you regret the tone of that initial response to what happened? My initial response was to the initial news stories you will recall, I'm sure, that initially what we were informed was that there was a break, uh, breakout from Gaza concentration camp, that approximately 1,500 people had broken out, and that about 50 people, that was the initial number that was given, approximately 50 Israelis were killed. The number gradually grew, went from 50, a couple of days later it went to 100, and I'm sure you'll remember the number didn't reach 1,400 until about 10 days later. Initially it was reasonable, <clears throat> excuse me, it was reasonable to assume that people had been killed in a firefight, which was not the case, at least not fully the case. So my initial reaction was to the initial news stories. By the third or fourth day, I was clearly compelled to rethink my initial statements and try to make sense of what was clearly a moral quandary. And at that point, I revised my, not revised, but I uh, considered my judgment on the basis of the new information that was available. Okay. And my own sense, yes, go I ahead. Just want to, I, just want to, I just want to, look, I've done a timeline uh, for my own benefit uh, based on what happened that day. We know the attacks began at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, we know that at 11.18 a.m., Israel confirmed, as you say, 40 dead, 700 injured. At 11.35, Benjamin Netanyahu said, we are at war. At 12.30 that day at lunchtime, I tweeted, horrifying and appalling scenes from Israel. This murderous, indiscriminate Hamas terror attack on Israeli people is shameful and indefensible. By 4.17, Israel said 100 were dead at least, 985 wounded, civilian hostages have been taken. At 4 o'clock, uh, a little later than that, around the same time, footage is released of the attack reporting that 3,000 uh, bombs and firearms have been fired off by Hamas, civilians have been killed, and so on. Uh, and yet at 6.30, and then again at, at 9.16, uh, you were retweeting your initial uh, substack, uh, and you then added at 9.16 uh, that the, you felt the hostage situation was crocodile tears. So I would take issue uh, with your uh, statement that you thought it was only after two or three days that anyone had a clue about the scale of what had happened here. It was very obvious during that Saturday about the mounting scale of horror. And I just don't understand why someone mm -hmm. as scholarly as you, as expert in this 
region and this conflict as you are, why well, your response would be that for several days, one of glorifying in the uh, in, in, what, in what you called heroic resistance, whereas mine, and I've always tried to be fair-minded about this conflict and reported it for CNN and tried to be fair and accurate as and when I've seen it, uh, that I, at, at midday that day, I'm talking about a murderous, indiscriminate terror attack and horrifying and appalling scenes. I just don't, I just don't believe that you weren't aware, with great respect, about the scale mm -hmm. of what was going on. Okay, Pierce, let me begin by saying I want to have a civil conversation and I'm going to do my darndest to remain faithful to the facts and faithful to truth. I'll do my darndest not to exaggerate. The first thing I have to say is I don't tweet. I've never been on Twitter. I have three young tech people who I send statements to and then they make the decision where to place it on Substack, on Twitter, and so forth. Okay, I just want to clear that up. I made one statement on the first day on the basis of the information that was available to me. The information was 50 people had been killed. Now, my memory is, but I won't claim my memory is infallible, the numbers didn't start to grow until the next day. That's not true. As the numbers, okay. It's just not true. Piers. Well, Professor, with respect. Okay, I'm not going to. It's not true. Piers, Piers, Piers. Yeah, but you have to listen to what I say. But you want me to, you am, want me to believe not, you when you say you weren't yeah. aware of the scale of this no, for Piers, several days. I, I, and wait, I find wait. that just, I'm incredulous. Uh, you want me to believe that? Okay, Piers, Piers, Piers. I'm not going to force you to believe it, and I'm not going to even try to impose my will. I'm simply saying, as a factual matter, speaking for myself, I was not aware that the numbers had been beyond 50 when I made that statement. I will further state, I will further state that to my knowledge, I could be mistaken, that I did not make another statement until the numbers started to grow. And I admit, I have said to you, it was a moral quandary for me. And I said in many interviews that it was for me a very burdened moment because I wasn't entirely confident in my moral judgment. And it was at that point that I started to look back at what the white abolitionists had to say when Nat Turner carried out a slave rebellion and many whites were uh, hacked to death, children were beheaded. And I wanted to see, because I was not confident of my moral judgment, I wanted to see what did the white abolitionists, those who fought against slavery, have to say? And I looked at what William Lloyd Garrison, probably the most famous of the white abolitionists, and he said, horrible things happened during Nat Turner's rebellion, but if you read his statement, he wouldn't condemn Nat Turner or Nat Turner's All right, well, let me ask you, okay, so let me ask you, oh, mm -hmm. let me ask you, okay, listen, I, I've heard you say this before, that analogy, that's fine. But let me ask you, given you now know the scale of what happened, given you know 1,200 people were killed, including 800 or so completely innocent civilians, we, we know that children uh, were killed, that grandmothers were killed, and their deaths face time to their families. We know that over 200 people were, were kidnapped and taken hostage. Given you know the full scale of this attack, I've asked a lot of guests this, these two questions, and I'll be curious about your answer. One, would you categorize it as a terror attack? And secondly, would you condemn Hamas for what they did? My view is as follows. Number one, as far as the evidence shows now, atrocities occurred on October 7th. The magnitude of the atrocities and the types of atrocities, for example, were children beheaded, were women raped. 
That remains, so far as I can tell from the evidence, an open question. However, that there were atrocities that occurred, my answer is yes. Number two, that's a, that's a factual question. Then there well, the question was, was question. it a terror attack? Yeah. Well, atrocities, it seems to me, denotes a terror attack. Okay, thank that's you. That's what atrocities okay. are. Thank you. Okay. So, number two, that's the factual question. And then there is the legal question. As a matter of law, it seems unquestionable that the people who perpetrated these atrocities would be prosecuted and convicted in a court of law. However, I would say on the legal question, I should think that there would be some mercy shown because those who carried out the atrocities were concentration camp inmates. Number three, which I think is the one that concerns you the most, is the moral question. And at a moral level, my view is my basic precept. We may disagree. My basic precept is that there but for the grace of God go I. That is to say, I'm very reluctant to condemn people who are in a position or in a condition such that were I in that position or condition, I'm not sure what I would do. Now, the 1,500 young men who burst the gates of Gaza, they were born into a concentration camp. They lived for two decades in a concentration camp. They had no past, they had no present, they had no future, they had no jobs. Half of them, according to humanitarian organizations, suffered from what's called severe food insecurity. And then on top of that, as I'm sure you know, Pierce, because you keep up with the news, Periodically, Israel goes into Gaza and it mows the lawn. And you know what mows the lawn means. It means a high-tech massacre in Gaza. In 2008-9, Operation Cast Lead. 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense. 2014, Operation Protective Edge. And in each of these high-tech massacres, visited on the people of Gaza, in some cases hundreds, in some cases thousands of Palestinians are killed. Okay, and let me in ask fact, you... just an opera... Well, let me ask okay. you on that so, point. in light of... And then, I want to finish though, your, I, I want to finish well, One your, question yeah. about that. In that period... Yes. In that period, and by the way, I, I've been condemnatory of some of the things you've just talked about publicly. I've tweeted my condemnation of some of these things. Uh, and I've, uh, I've tried to shine a light on the plight of the Palestinians for many, many years. And I feel that the oppression uh, of the Palestinian people for many decades has been absolutely outrageous. So we, on that, we can completely agree. Um, but when it comes to what you're saying here, it seems to me what you're trying to paint is a picture of some kind of moral justification for what Hamas did. And that's where you lose me. Because I don't see why there could be any, anyone who can see the scale of what Hamas did on October the 7th and not simply condemn it out of hand, you may also want to condemn some of the response by Israel. That's completely normal. I would say that there are serious question marks about the proportionality of what they've been doing. But if you can't start from a basic humanity position of saying what happened on October the 7th was a, a disgusting terror attack worthy of condemnation, then for me, I find it very hard to then respect anyone's demand for people to condemn Israel and their response. Pierce, I'm really, and I'm trying to be candid with you. Number one, I appreciate your humanity. I do. I don't know you from Adam. I'm not a TV or a television or a social media kind of person. I'm a book person. I'm old fashioned. However, I do recall that when that famous moment when Susan Boyle appeared on Britain's Got Talent, and I remember the camera turning to you, focusing on you, I could see it in my mind's eye. I saw your eyes narrow, and suddenly the humanity in you came up. Here is this obscure woman 
whose talent had gone unrecognized. And if I can speak to that same program, for me, the most poignant moment, the one I carry with me my entire, since that moment, was when Simon Cowell asked um, Susan Boyle, well, why haven't you been discovered yet? And she replied, because I haven't been given a chance. And that's how I feel about the people of Gaza. That's how I feel about those young men in Gaza. You ask me why I won't condemn them. Because those young men were born into a concentration camp. They were born into among the most dense popul uh, populated places on, on God's earth. Half of the population of Gaza's children, 70% are refugees who were expelled from Israel in 1948 and their descendants. 70% of those of Gaza's youth have no jobs, no future, no nothing. They are Susan Boyle times 10,000, never given a chance. And as things looked the night before October 7th, when the question of Gaza was disappearing from the public stage, I will admit to you, peers, I myself had given up on Gaza. In 2020, I decided it's hopeless, it's pointless, I only have a finite number of years left in my life, and it's time for me to move on. And I'll tell you, that was a wrenching decision on my part, because I knew I was abandoning the people who for 15 years I had devoted my life to chronicling every detail of the horror that had been inflicted on those people. And I gave up on them. Okay. And that meant if I gave up, they had no future because I was the last chronicler. Okay, but what I would say Gaza. All right, but what I, would I have the only right, book but, but Professor, that's been written on this subject. Let me subject. respond. Let me respond. I respond, I would respond by saying that what people in Israel would say and what Jewish people would say, particularly who live in Israel, is that they were facing a constant barrage of rockets from Hamas, that Hamas won political power in 2005-6, that they were given a huge amount of money uh, and could have done whatever they wanted with that money, but chose to pursue a path of effectively terrorizing uh, the Israelis over that period. And the Israelis, you're right, they responded in a, they have a far superior military, and they responded in the way that they did. And this cycle has been going on in repeat and repeat and repeat. But where you and I differ about this is that I think what happened October the 7th was just uh, on a different scale to anything we've seen and the way it was carried out. And I just don't think saying that people who have been oppressed, which they undoubtedly were for many years, that that justifies them committing that act of terror. But let's take a break. Let's come back after the break. Welcome back. I'm still with Professor Norman Finkelstein. Professor, just to round off what we've just been discussing, Given that you wrote that substick uh, and you, you want me to believe, and OK, I'll take your word for it, that you were completely oblivious to the reality of what had happened here and the scale of it. Um, but given you're not now oblivious to that, why have you not removed that substack, given the language is so clearly offensive to people and you based it, by your own words, on a false premise about what had happened? You know, Piers... That's a very good question. And this morning, when I was talking to some friends from the UK, I was warned you would ask that question. I'll honestly tell you, I never fear the truth. I don't. I feel the truth is a very powerful weapon on the side of the oppressed. I never fear it. Now, I'm going to give you the answer. Again, you can or can't disagree with me or believe me. I was tempted to remove it. I was tempted to, quote unquote, protect myself. I didn't remove it 
because I thought that's intellectually dishonest. I wrote that statement. It's part of the historical record. It's part of the documentary record. And I shouldn't do what Stalin used to do. So when he published photographs of the Bolshevik Revolution, he would take Trotsky's picture out. Okay, but let me, and okay, that's let me, the okay. image. So you won't delete so it. So that was that's but, the image you, that stuck to me. You, but, but, I, but, all right, you haven't deleted it, but do do you do you regret it? Do I regret what? Do you regret the contents of that Substack, given that you now know what really happened? Yes, if it can be misconstrued to mean that I wrote that with full knowledge of what happened, of course I regret it. Okay. However, it remains part of the record. And as a serious scholar, I'm not a great scholar, I'm not in the ranks of the great British historians, but I take scholarship seriously. I did not want to denature, to falsify, to misrepresent the documentary record. But let me ask you. I let me ask you, that, Professor. All right, let me ask and you. And I will leave it there. Okay, but okay. That's fair. Listen, that's your decision. You are the son of two people who survived the Holocaust, who were both in concentration camps. Uh, you're, you're a Jewish man, uh, and you know how incendiary that substack has proven to be with Jewish people around the world, who many of whom have felt this is the nearest thing to the Holocaust of World War II that they've endured. What your parents went through, being revisited on them in these kibbutzes on October the 7th. Um, what do you feel about them? I mean, how would your parents have felt about you literally on the day that this happened, talking about heroic resistance, talking about that you will never begrudge the scenes uh, that you, the stars in heaven are looking kindly down, glory, glory, the souls of Gaza go marching on. How would your parents have felt about mm -hmm. that, coming out of concentration camps, surviving the Holocaust of World War II? Well, first of all, anything I write, I have my parents looking at the screen behind me over my shoulders in a metaphorical sense. I am very conscious every moment of my existence, every moment of my existence goes back to the martyrdom of my family. So it's not as if suddenly you're posing a question to me that never occurred to me. Quite the contrary, I do need even 30 years after their death, I need the moral validation that came from my parents' martyrdom and the extermination of their family. How would my parents have reacted? My guess is if on the first day they heard that inmates in a concentration camp burst its gates, I think my parents would be very pleased at that fact. As the events became clearer, my guess, but this is pure speculation, my guess is my parents would go out with their hearts, would go out to those who burst the gates of the concentration camp and whose lives were destroyed. Now you will say to me completely legitimately, you would say, well, what would your parents feel about the innocents who were slaughtered in the atrocities on that date? So I'm going to give you as close an answer as I could give, I, as I'm able to. I once asked my late mother, I said to her, what was your feeling when you heard that the German cities were being terror bombed during World War II? the carpet bombing of the German cities targeting civilians. What was your feeling? And my mother's response to me was, quote, our feeling was 
if we're going to die, we're going to take some of them with us. Now, that's not the most morally elevated statement. I agree. And do I wish my mother had and my father had a heightened sensitivity to German civilian life? I suppose I would wish it. But I will tell you, Piers, to the last day of my parents' life, it was unthinkable that they would have a kind word to say about Germans. And it was unthinkable that I would ever quarrel with them on that point. Okay. I accepted, I accepted that given their life experience, they okay. had the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Okay. And the people Professor of Gaza have the right to hate the people who destroyed their lives. Professor Finkelstein, uh, thank you for that answer. And I don't mean to cut you off. We've got uh, another guest waiting to respond to what we've been discussing. I'd like to get you back on. I feel like we've had a, a good conversation. I don't agree with you about some of it, obviously. That's been clear. But I respect the tone that you've adopted for the interview. And I'd like to explore more of this with you another time. I want to just say one last word. Everybody warned me you wouldn't let me speak, that you would speak over me, you would stop me. I want everybody to know you are eminently fair, you are decent, and you are that same human being whose eyes narrowed as Susan Boyle began to perform. Okay. You have that humanity, and I deeply respect it. Thank you. Professor, I appreciate you coming on. Thank you very much.